Hello YouTube, Jonathan here, and for this video we are going to take a look at the Soviet Union. They go second in this game of Axis and Allies 1940 Global. Uh, you may have seen a different Soviet Union video go up earlier today. I'm not sure what happened, if the file got corrupted or some there was some issue when my phone tried to upload it, but it shows as just over 12 minutes but it will only play about seven and a half. And I tried up re-uploading it and that still didn't fix it. So I'm just gonna shoot another video. Um, you won't see me moving pieces around, but I'll just explain uh, the thought process behind it. Before I get to that, uh, there are a few things that I want to mention. In the German video, I had said that Germany outproduces the Soviet Union even without national objectives. Uh, that is true for the Europe board. I did not. I was looking at the uh, boxes, the Soviet Union box and the Germany box, and the German box says 30 IPCs, the Soviet says 28. But if you throw in the Asian portion of the Soviet Union, I believe they are up to 37 at that point. Uh, so they would produce more if there are no national objectives. However, with the national objectives, Germany makes another 10. Uh, five from the Soviet Union, and five, I believe it is from having uh, Norway and Denmark, and Sweden is neutral. So that's another ten. Plus, they're going to be uh, getting money from Finland up there on their first turn. And that was uh, something else I want to comment on. Um, I was so focused on not getting units out of position, I wasn't even thinking about the extra production. But uh, Germany will get some extra production if they move in there, and some extra units. So I have just moved one guy over there uh, to activate that, and I shuffled some guys up from Denmark on my transport up to Norway uh, to help secure that. Um, let's see here. Oh, and then also they would get uh, more production from France, from Paris, and then from Normandy. And if you want to go for southern France, you can. Um, I did not in this situation, but that's worth another couple of production. I also or rather it was brought to my attention that um, it is possible for England to scramble uh, some fighters over in this sea zone. So I decided that instead of doing that, I would go ahead and attack this transport, but instead of attacking or this transport and destroyer that was over here, but instead of attacking this one, um, I'm going to send that sub in here to help strengthen uh, that assault. Um, and in thinking about that, uh, there are enough forces over here in these two sea zones that even if England were to scramble everything, uh, Germany should be able to take them out. Uh, so there really is no point in England scrambling there. There could be a point, however, in them scrambling over here. And so I'm just not going to send my sub that way. Uh, aside from that, I have made a number of non-combat moves and also kind of simulated, as you can see, what... The situation might look like after the battles in the German video. Um, I have uh, the general strategy uh, with this movement is to move the infantry, especially, or everything that can only move one space, really. So infantry and artillery up this way along the front, and then uh, keep the units that can move twice, so your mechanized infantry and your tanks uh, over you know, just a little bit further behind. That also puts us in a position we could go after Yugoslavia if we want to. Or, I'm sorry, if Germany wants to. Um, because I'm focusing on Germany's moves, I, I'm thinking of, uh, of playing as the Axis. Um, I will switch to the Soviet Union here in just a little bit. But uh, Germany is in a position to go after Yugoslavia if it wants to. It also has a carrier here with a fighter and a tactical bomber on it. Uh, we've got a fighter and a tactical bomber in uh, Holland, and we also have the same thing over here in West Germany along with two bombers. So uh, probably not enough to take out England because they're going to put units down on their turn. Uh, however, if they do something foolish, we do have a significant force we could throw their way if we wanted to. Uh, along with a cruiser bombardment and a battleship bombardment. We do just have the one transport, though, so we'll want to think about that carefully, uh, but if the opportunity presents itself, that is certainly an option for us. I've also positioned some fighters down here 
to help with scrambling uh, if it makes sense to do so if the British decide to come in here and do something annoying. We are going after the Soviet Union, so we don't really need to worry about them being in position on turn two. We're probably going to uh, hit them either turn three or four, depending on how things look. Um, we're not going to get that far in this strategy video, uh, but this German opening really has no intention of attacking the Soviet Union, uh, of course, on turn one or even on turn two, because our units are way out of position. Uh, the earliest we would think about doing that is turn three, and we're probably going to do it on turn four. Uh, so that's Germany. Now let's move over to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union uh, is not able to attack Germany until either its fourth turn or when Germany attacks it. And we can see, as the Soviet player, that uh, Germany is in no real position to cause us much damage at all. Uh, so we're not too worried about that. We're going to buy mostly infantry on the first turn. And uh, the idea is that we're going to cr basically create a wall, um, as you can kind of see here. Um, this does include the new units that I placed at the end of the uh, original Soviet video. Um, and the reason that we're going to go with infantry is because, uh, yes, we know that we need stuff to counterattack, and we are going to get to that, but we don't need it on the first turn. Um, and the uh, infantry and artillery can only move one unit, so we want to start with those so they can get the earliest jump uh, on placement and then getting into position because it's going to take them the longest to get wherever we want. And then uh, on turn two, on turn three especially, we'll start to build some more offensive troops, uh, maybe a fighter, maybe a tank or, or a couple tanks, um, that sort of thing. But on turn one... We know there's no attack coming on turn two, and if it is, uh, there isn't much to back it up, so we're not too worried about it. If the Germans want to attack us when they're way out of position, that's fine. Um, then we have the potential to get a bunch of national objectives on bonus money that we can't if we are uh, not at war. So essentially what I've done here is, I, like I said, I have created that wall with units that can only move one space, um, concentrated them more. Uh, here in Ukraine as well as in Leningrad up there. We're going to expect that those will be the focal points of the German attack. Um, two main spearheads directed in those both those directions. We have a little bit uh, of infantry in these other two uh, to either help with countering or if for some reason the Germans decide they want to do something else, we have a little bit in their way. But we want to focus our, our defensive strength where we think uh, their objectives are going to be. We've taken our units that can move two, and we've positioned them strategically so that they can hit multiple spots along the front uh, for counterattacking purposes. We do have tanks here in Ukraine. We can hit Bessarabia. We can also come up here and hit East Poland if they move into there. Um, and then we've got tanks up here that can hit uh, you know, those two places along the front. They can also hit these two places up here. What we may do eventually, if the situation allows us, is make an offensive into Finland. However, early at this stage, my assumption is that the forces from Germany are going to be near overwhelming, and so we're going to need everything possible to try and fend off the original, uh, the initial attack to blunt that, and then we might be able to send some forces elsewhere. You do see some forces scattered back here, and that is simply because they are on their march forward to this wall. Um, they just can't quite get there on the first turn. And what we may do, uh, as I look at this, I may want to move maybe this tank, uh, maybe on turn two this tank, and uh, mechanized infantry up here, because it can still hit both of those territories uh, from there, and that would give us some extra defense in that. Uh, that spot. You'll see that I also have moved everything away from this border here, and the reason for that is if we concentrate on the front, uh, a couple things um, could negatively impact us. One, uh, we can try and defend everything equally, which means the Germans are just going to uh, hit places that are of strategic importance because we haven't built those up enough, or uh, 
we will concentrate our forces and then the Germans will uh, just factor that into their attacking and they'll just attack where we're weak. Uh, and so I've moved uh, everything away from the front here. Um, also because when the Germans attack they'll be able to send in masses of infantry and uh, tanks and everything else. Uh, however, if we are back here, the first turn when they go to attack, their infant, their masses of infantry and artillery can move in. They'll have to stop here. If they want to attack further, then their tanks are going to be their tanks and mechanized infantry are going to become separated from all of their uh, infantry fodder. And if they want to do that, that, if they want to send handfuls of tanks forward into our the teeth of our defenses here with no fodder, uh, that's fine with me. And so that's kind of how we have things set up here. We also have moved our navy here over one space. The reason for that is if the uh, Germans, whenever the Germans do decide they want to attack us, if we leave our navy here, they could do uh, an amphibious assault, try and clear it out and attack uh, either Baltic states or Leningrad up here on that same move. However, if our forces are out here, they're going to have to come in and clear this out before they can move forward. So that gives us another turn before they can do an amphibious assault on Leningrad up here. For the time being, we are going to leave our sub over here. We can't really use that as a blocker, I don't believe. Uh, and eventually we will want to move it forward into C-Zone 125 to disrupt a convoy. Um, I suppose we could do that now. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I mean, we aren't going to disrupt the convoy. We can't uh, because we aren't at war. But we'll go ahead and just move him there. He can't block anything, so we might as well have him in position uh, so that the Germans can't move like a destroyer or something and block us later. Now, one other thing down here uh, in this area, we could attempt to go after Iraq. We could also attempt to activate Persia. Now, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, I've been doing a little checking online, and from what I understand, uh, technically, the Soviet Union could declare war on Japan. It would have no ramifications whatsoever, but that would cause them to be considered an ally, which would allow them to activate pro-ally neutrals. Um, my personal opinion, um, thinking about things historically, I am not really a fan of that. Um, the Soviet Union at this stage certainly was not a friend of France or England or even the United States. Um, they were on friendly terms uh, with Nazi Germany, and uh, you know not not to the extent that uh, Italy and Japan were, but they had that treaty, the Non-Aggression Pact, um, and so I would hardly call them an ally. Uh, now maybe you could say declaring war on Japan changes that. Um, personally, I would. Uh, argue against that and say they are not an ally until they are at war with Germany. There's actually combat taking place over here. Um, but if the rules actually allow, uh, you know, technically allow for it, the Soviet Union could send one infantry down here on turn one and then another one here on turn two and try to get those guys and march them back up. Um, it's also possible that England, you know, sweeps around on its turn one and gets it and then starts transporting guys back. That might be a little more efficient. Um, sending one guy down probably isn't going to hurt the Soviets too much. Now, another option could be trying to go after Iraq, move guys here turn one, and then hit Iraq turn two. It is worth uh, two production, plus uh, the Soviets will get some extra production because of one of their national objectives once they are at war. However, uh, if you want to move anything other than an infantry or two down here, so we're talking a tank um, or something like that, uh, then you are way out of position. And so let's see, it takes one turn to get here, two turns to get here. By turn three, your tank is up here. By your turn four, which is the latest the Germans can possibly attack, the closest you can get is here. And that's, your turn is after Germany. Um, so Germany has done a major invasion, and you have a tank um, that 
you can't even counter with on that turn. You know, maybe you could do something with a fighter. Um, I didn't look too closely uh, at that, admittedly. But it just seems like it gets you way out of position coming down here. I don't think that's something that I would really do. Um, and I probably wouldn't go after Persia as well. I probably would let England do it. Because then England can transport guys back over here. Um, or England can start sending them up this way. And because it can activate them on turn one, they can actually get those infantry faster than you can. Um, so if you want them to help you, then uh, it still might be advantageous for England to come and get them and just march them up that way. So that's what I'm thinking as the Soviet Union. Um, please feel free to comment. Thank you for the comments on the other video and for uh, pointing out some things that I did not notice. Um, being that this is my first time really, really getting into this game, watching, uh, you know, the different videos online, um, your comments have definitely helped me see some things that I didn't see otherwise, and I hope that my videos, uh, there's something in here that has also helped you see things that perhaps you did not see, uh, prior. And with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and stop this video, and, uh, hopefully we don't have another... Uh, corrupted file issue and uh, you guys can see this whole thing. Have a good afternoon everybody.